So now we find ourselves in a similar position to where those who formed the Workers' Party found themselves. Just as we have listened to Hopper, so they had read Rothbard. And then the question they had, which is the question we have, how to act on those ideas. Professor Hopper's insights can leave you wondering how best to act on them. As Hopper has said, one thing you can do immediately is stop using the term limited government. Gillard and Gittins do not support unlimited government. So when you say you support limited government, you are not saying much. Yet that is precisely what the CIS, the IPA, Andrew Bolt, etc. do. It is generally thought that there are two ways of judging the Workers' Party. One is by how many members and votes it attracted. The other is by how effective its education program was. But what exp experience teaches us is that the ideas of the Workers' Party failed to attract popular support. Not because the Workers' Party campaigners were outsmarted by others, but because they were outstupided. <laughs> they threw pearls before swine, and that is all they could have done. But there is a third way of judging the Workers' Party, and that is that they knew the truth and communicated it in a clear, fun, and largely uncompromising manner. In that sense, they were a brilliant success and the high point of free market advocacy in Australia. The CIS, the IPA, Andrew Bolt, etc., are all pinkos in comparison who have gone out of their way to ignore this passage from the Workers' Party platform. Quote, this is from the Workers' Party platform. Quote, taxation is theft. Taxation, which is legalised coercion and robbery by government, is no less immoral than coercion and robbery committed by private individuals. End quote. With economics.org.au, Neville Kennard has been shoving libertarian arguments at many of you for over a year now, and most of you have refused to engage with his arguments. So if you want to know why the Workers' Party failed, you only need to ask yourselves for why you don't engage with libertarian arguments. Lastly, I want to make one comment on, ver on various judgments of the Workers' Party. Just because we are able to say that certain aspects of the Workers' Party failed, it does not necessarily mean we know how to do it better. For example, in our eyes, the Libertarian Party might seem a better and more straightforward for forward name, but most voters consider libertarianism to be libertinism, so it is by no means a sure success. Even when Lang Hancock is as rich as can be and demands that he be allowed to be even richer, and everyone perceives, perceives him as greedy, even that, I do not believe, is bad for libertarian ad advocacy, since it means criticism of capitalists as lazy can be put to rest. And that is very significant. Why Workers' Party, why workers party activists did not employ this line of argument, I do not know. It would have allowed them to be on the attack rather than apologising for having such rich supporters which is a bad look. And even when Lang Hancock talks about how mining is the most important industry, describing his philosophy using the German term mining über alles, mining above all else, with all the World War II baggage that entails, even that I am not convinced is bad for libertarian advocacy. Hancock should have exaggerated his, his eccentricities even more. He should have been more charismatic. Hancock was often on the defensive when he should have been on the attack. For example, repeatedly saying that he is not an academic and that he does not wish his enemies on other people as a reason not to join the Workers' Party. Anyone who is serious about their beliefs wishes their enemies on everyone. Now, on the Workers' Party panel here, we have Viv Forbes, a ghostwriter for Lang Hancock. It is true that Lang Hancock is dead, but that hasn't stopped me from calling him a staff member of economics.org.au because I employ his work. So I am interested to know what I would need to do to become Hancock's ghostwriter today and write his great magnum opus. I have a good title in mind for it, and when you hear it, you will see how Hancock could have transcended his disadvantageous eccentricities and turned them into positive ones by showing no shame or hesitancy whatsoever. The title of my proposed upcoming book by Lang Hancock on how Australia will be the world's quarry is also German sounding. My proposed title is Mine camp. <laughs> now, I have done some research in the, in the panel members on the panel members here, and I've put, put up nearly 100 items featuring the Workers' Party at www.workersparty.info. Uh, so, uh, before they introduce themselves, I might just quote from some of what my research has uncovered. In a 1976 anonymous article in Fremont. Free Enterprise magazine, it reads, David Hart, who's on the panel, says, David Hart is 18 years old. 
David not only is the youngest libertarian member of the Workers' Party, he is also one of the most well-read, knowledgeable and intelligent libertarians in Australia. He has an impressive command of libertarian philosophy and will be intimately involved in the informal education group of President being set up in New South Wales. Viv Forbes is 37 years old. A business analyst and geologist with Mount Isa Mines, Viv Forbes got the party going in Queensland. He is a quiet, retiring man, devoid of ego problems, who has quietly devoted large amounts of time, energy and his own money to the Queensland branch of the WP. His official position is that of Provisional Secretary of the party in Queensland. He is a libertarian. They, they always add in whether he's a libertarian or not. And maybe to start us off, each of the panel members can introduce themselves, say what their various roles and titles were in the Workers' Party, and maybe share an anecdote or two. Um, and the, in addition to the panel members here sitting down, we also have Maureen Nathan, who uh, should make her way to the front, and Jeff McNeil. Uh, my introduction to it uh, from Western Australia was that I read a, a letter to the editor in the Bulletin magazine by a John Whiting of Adelaide who signed over the heading, The Movement for Limited Government. I read the letter and it was magnificent. I said, I'm off to Adelaide, I'm going to meet this guy. So we got to Adelaide and I looked in the phone book, there were 12 John Whitings. I, read, I phoned 11 of them and they really didn't want to know about anyone that wrote a letter to the Bulletin magazine. But I got the, the 12th one and, and it, he was a Dr. John Whiting. So I rang this guy and I said, uh, <clears throat> by any chance did you write a letter to the uh, Bulletin? He said, uh, well, did you like it or didn't you like it? <laughs> and I said, I liked it. And he said, where are you? And I said, told him which motel I was staying at. And he said, hold on, I'll be there in five minutes. He burst through the door of the motel room, saw on the desk a little book by von Mises called Planned Chaos. And he said, have you read that? And I said, yes. And he said, that saves us five bloody hours, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, now where are, you where are you going from Adelaide? And I said, I'm off to Sydney to do some business. And he said, well, forget about your business. The minute you get to Sydney, you've got to see Dr. Duncan Yule, you've got to see Bob Howard, you've got to see Mark Teer, because there's big things on. We're putting together a, a platform for, uh, for a new political party. Just step off the plane and go straight and see these people, which is what I did. And I found this, this, this group in a re revolutionaries in a little room putting together <laughs> the Workers' Party platform. <laughs> Some of them are here tonight, and uh, and that's that's real, really how it happened. But it's the whole story of my life: things that happened by accident. And uh, you can plan things, but you've got to expose yourself to chance when it happens. And that started. I I was introduced to libertarianism many years before that, when I was age 16, by a fellow called Leonard E. Reed of the Foundation for Economic Education. So I was I was ready for ideas like this. And um, we didn't take over the world. We didn't get to be Prime Minister or anything like that. We got, uh, Jeff McNeil got the best 14% uh, of the votes in the, in the electorate of Greenwich, which is more than the ALP get, got in that election. But it started a chain of events and all the people that were part of the Workers' Party and Progress Party in those times are still activists. They became natural activists and I bump into them in all walks of life and they've all got extremely important and influential positions. It's, it is remarkable that it set a chain of events on. And uh, I, I got a little bit sick of being one of the only lonely libertarians in Western Australia so I kicked off something that was based on the Foundation for Economic Education and we call it the Man Cow. Economic Education Foundation in WA and we've, we now have 400 young people that we've set to various internships and uh, so I'm no longer lonely, I've got a bunch of 400 young people. They might not be hardcore libertarians, quite. They might not be hardcore Austrians but I tell you what, 
they can put up a very good argument and they're sick of seeing this conventional morality that we accept in Australia where votes can be bought and the bill can be sent to the future generations. That's what's called accepted morality. It's buying votes from the brain dead and sending the bill to the unborn. <laughs> we find that to be taxed beyond the point of toleration is not a problem anymore because the people, the skills, the talents and the capital just get on the first plane. And 84% of Australia's exploration budget is being spent out of Australia. In Africa, South America and the former Soviet Union countries, developing mines that will be competing with our own mines within five years. It's all happened. Nobody worries too much about the mining tax because they've gone. You get double tax if you stay here and explore and develop assets in your own country. You get a tax break if you go anywhere else. So we're quite relaxed about all this. End of story. Thanks very much. Oh, you're waiting for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got a few uh, confessions uh, to Benjamin. Uh, firstly, I wasn't a libertarian when the Workers' Party was formed. I had nothing to do with this document. And, uh, in fact, I was coerced into my position <laughs> in, in the Workers' Party. It, uh, it happened like this. I was a uh, very conservative, uh, suit-wearing, tie-wearing uh, economic uh, analyst for uh, 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 Queensland's biggest mining company. Uh, I'd not looked at any uh, political theories beyond reading one book which did have a big, big influence on me. The book was called The Conscience of a Conservative by Barry Goldwater. That's the closest I ever came to libertarianism until I heard about this party that was a free enterprise party and I thought that sounded pretty good because at that stage uh, uh, Whitlam uh, was around, the unions were running riot and I thought something needed to be done. So I came down to Sydney and met Bob Howard. He sounded a fairly sensible, uh, sincere sort of a bloke, a bit way out ideas, I thought. Uh, then uh, I heard about the formation of the party in Sydney and uh, they sent me this little black book. And I read this and I thought, this is outrageous. <laughs> it's great, they'll never achieve it. They're gonna do things like sell the ABC. <laughs> I thought, oh, <laughs> so I thought I'll go down to Sydney and see what this bunch is all about. So I, I came down to the Opera House uh, opening. Uh, my wife and I sat very quietly up the back trying not to be noticed. Uh, the next day we went to, I think, Duncan Ewell's place uh, for a barbecue. And uh, I was still uh, probably in my suit and tie watching these people and thinking they looked a bit like a bunch of hippies, uh, quite a few of them. And, they had rogues and rascals like John Singleton associated with them. And uh, then uh, someone, I think it was Duncan Yule, uh, said, uh, well, we better get uh, moving, eh? Uh, you, Ron, you can get things organised in Western Australia. And uh, Mike Stanton, you can do things in uh, Tasmania. And uh, Viv, you'll uh, do things in Queensland, won't you? And I mumbled non-committally and quiet, quietly went back to Brisbane and thought no more about it. About two weeks later, the Courier Mail rang me up and said, I hear you're the uh, organiser of a new political party. <laughs> and in that instant, I had to accept or deny them. And so I said, uh, yes. And the reporter said, what are you? And I said, I'm the uh, uh, convener. And uh, it was in the Courier Mail the next day and all... <laughs> All my conservative friends wondered where I'd been hiding my affinity with the workers up to that date. And uh, at the time I had been reading the uh, biography of Stalin 
and it impressed me that the way Stalin got control of the Communist Party was by volunteering, almost, to be secretary of the party. Uh, on the basis that the secretary wrote the minutes, he wrote the agenda, he told the chairman what to, what to say and speak, he organised functions. In fact, he controlled the whole show. So in about two weeks' time, I decided I would be state secretary of the Workers' Party. <laughs> <coughs> I put out a statement to that effect, which nobody contradicted. <laughs> and I continued doing that for about five years. <laughs> that, that was my history of the Workers' Party. And in that time, then, I learned to become a libertarian. Thanks, Viv. Thanks, Ron. Uh, I'm Mark Tier. I... Um actually helped write this. I, get, I can't remember what I wrote, but I'm told I wrote the economic stuff in there. Maureen is the one who remembers things so well. <laughs> um, my background is in, I did economics and political science at ANU. I possibly have the rare distinction of, in my third year of economics, discovering Ludwig von Mises. And Stupidly in retrospect, but it was fun. I uh, argued against the examiners in the exam from <laughs> Von Bizzi's perspective with the result that I had to repeat my third year of economics <laughs> in order to get to the degree. Um, I don't really have a lot to say. I was a Senate candidate for what it's worth in the uh, Workers' Party in New South Wales. That was fun. I got to go around and argue with lots of people I'd never met before. Um, you know, it was a great time. I was... How old was I, Maureen? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. 25 or something like that. And here I was in the limelight. And I was one of the hippies. You know, my beard was <laughs> longer than his. And my hair was even longer. Um, and, you know, I was, I was doing what I believed in and I was in, you know, in that part of the useful enthusiasm of one's life when, when you believe that all you've got to do is say, hey, this is how it really is and they'll say, oh yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it doesn't work that way. I discovered something very interesting. I was in the office of Doug Anthony at one point. Um, who was the, then the Deputy Prime Minister, I guess. This was after the election. And what I discovered was, I was trying to tell him that, they'd just been elected, that's right, that you know, what you do now, the policies you put into effect now, will create the environment for when it's re-election time. And he just couldn't grasp that. And I realised that, that his time horizon as a politician was, say, a maximum of three weeks. If anything <laughs> took longer than three weeks to come to maturity, it was beyond his comprehension. <laughs> and, 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 and it was unbelievable that it was beyond his comprehension that he could you know, have an effect you know, at the time when it was important to him to be re-elected. Anyway, that, that's really getting off the subject. Um, so let me just say a couple of quick things. Um, one is interesting. I came to be a libertarian through reading Ayn Rand. I read The Fountainhead because I wanted to be an architect. I was then 14 years old. And then I read her other stuff. And, but that didn't make much impact until later. Um, anyway, then, this was several years later, I, uh, I was at the point I was r trying to write, because I you know, I was the only person I knew who, who'd read Ayn Rand, let alone, and I was lucky to find von Mises and other books in the uh, National Library in Canberra. I lived up, grew up in Canberra, so I didn't know anyone else. I was the only person, in the, certainly in Australia, who'd ever heard of these ideas, as far as I could tell. <coughs> so then I, um, I got to the point where, because Rand, as you know, if, you, if you're aware of her, her attitudes, is uh, advocates a limited government. I was attempting to write a constitution for a limited government. And at that point, for whatever reason, I went to Sydney, and I was in a bookshop in Sydney, King Street, no longer there, and I saw this little eight-page magazine called Free Enterprise on sale. And I looked at it and I saw this as Bob Howard, Merrill and Gieserkam, which I think were co-editors or co-publishers or whatever. And I went up to the um, proprietor and I said, look, 
Can you tell me, how can I get in touch with these people? This, this is Bob Howard and Merrill and Giza Cab. And he said, they're standing over there. <laughs> so I went back to, Bob, took, Bob and Merrill and took them back to his place. No, it wasn't, Merrill was not his girlfriend at that time, or subsequently as far as I know. But uh, I went back to his place and spent the night chatting and he lent me a book called Market for Liberty by um, Linda and, or the Tannehills, I can't remember her husband's name, Linda and Morris Tannehill. When I got back to Canberra, I read it and um, at that point I gave up trying to write a uh, constitution for any government, limited or otherwise, <laughs> because it, I became an anarchist overnight. Um, <coughs> the... There was something else I was going to say, but I've um, forgotten what it was. It tends to happen to me more and more these days. So, um, oh yes, I'll just give you one other, you know, my, in my real introduction to libertarianism. I mean, this is, you know, it's all very well to read about it, to, but to experience libertarianism is a different thing entirely. Now, you know, I'm a smoker. I'm one of the persecuted minority. <coughs> and I was a smoker back then when I met Bob Howard. And when we were starting the Workers' Party, you know, lots of other, you know, uh, smokers in the in the in the uh, in the room at that time, and we met at Bob's Howard place, Bob Howard's place, for a number of reasons. One of which he had all the books, and the other one was he had a big table in the kitchen, where we could all sit around. So we had one of the meetings. I can't remember what stage it was. It must have been early on because this was where the lesson came in. <coughs> um, we were sitting around his table, about a dozen of us. I'm not sure exactly who was there and how many, but about a dozen of us. And you've got to remember, especially if you're youngsters, that back then, if you were a smoker, you walked into somebody's house, you sat down, you pulled out a cigarette, you lit it, and you said, where's your ashtray? <laughs> in 1960, my father was in the army and he, we were in London, and he, when, he, when, he was, when he went back, came back here, you know, he, a non-smoker, was given as a going away present a silver ashtray with a matching silver cigarette lighter. And he didn't smoke. <laughs> Everyone knew that. Anyway, that was, it was a different world, right? You, you, you wanted to smoke, you smoked anywhere, it didn't matter. So here we are sitting around Bob Howard's kitchen table and, you know, I pull out a cigarette and a few other people pull out a cigarette and we're about to light them and Bob says, you can't smoke in here. I don't know, what? <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? He said, this is my property. And the penny dropped. <laughs> so in 1975, when this had never been done before, all the smokers in the room went outside to have a smoke. <laughs> when I was uh, 16 at high school, I um, read the novels of Ayn Rand and I was looking through the Sydney Morning Herald one morning and I noticed a, an ad in the, in the section on um, uh, sort of meetings and things like that, that there was an Ayn Rand discussion group and I was very interested in pursuing my interest in Ayn Rand and so I asked my parents, I said, um, do you mind if I borrow the car or can I go to this um, place? And they said, oh, where is it? And they said, oh, it's, I said, it's in Glebe, because Bob Howard's house was in, at Glebe Point Road. And my parents lived um, in the leafy North Shore and they said, Glebe? <laughs> 16 year old boy going to Glebe all by himself. This was not um, expected. Anyway, they finally relented and I went to a meeting of the Ayn Rand discussion group. And it was in the middle of a battlefield because they had just discovered Rothbard. <laughs> and so you had these Randians and these newly minted Rothbardians going at each other hammer and tongs. <laughs> and I walked into this uh, room as a sort of newly minted Randian and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And uh, very quickly after that I became um, a sort of Rothbardian um, uh, supporter. But this was my introduction to um, Bob Howard and his circle. This was in 1973, I think it was. Uh, but my role in the, in the Workers' Party was as very much an outsider, as an onlooker, because I was only 16 or 17 at the time. But Bob and I had become very close friends and we spent hours and hours and hours every week discussing 
Rand's ideas and Rothbard's ideas and Mises and so on. Um, and so um, I was sort of like a little parrot sitting on his shoulder as he was engaged with all this other activity on a committee writing the Workers' Party platform. I was sort of um, his sidekick listening in and, 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 and learning um, whatever I could from the conversations that were going on. Um, I'd just like to say something else about um, bookshops in Sydney because Mark opened the door to that. Um, I came across Mises um, in Bob Gould's bookshop in <laughs> Sydney. <laughs> I, Bob Gould was a notorious Marxist. And um, I came across Mises' book, Socialism, in his bookshop. And it had been categorised under socialism. <laughs> I think no one had read it but thought that the title sounded really interesting. Um, so I picked up this book and I thought, my God, this is amazing. And I read that. And I was, I was still only in high school. And, uh, and that was um, a real eye-opener for me. So in addition to having um, you know, Rand and Rothbard and, and Mises going on, uh, it, was, it was a very exciting time. And I was uh, a bit overwhelmed by it all. And uh, when I was in my last year at high school, uh, possibly under Bob Howard's influence, I, I went to a private school here in Sydney called Knox Grammar School, which is very conservative. And I challenged the, um, the vice principal to a public debate on the topic, is the state necessary? <laughs> and it was held one lunchtime and um, his sole argument was, how can a boy like you from such a nice family hold these views? <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> even my peers and colleagues said that, thought this was an unsound argument to use in a debate. <laughs> and even though they didn't agree with me, they believed that I held up my own in the, in the debate. Um, so here, all this, the other thing that uh, I was inspired to do very stupid things um, under the influence of, of these uh, political theorists was that um, in 1974 was my last year at high school and when we had the um, <coughs> prize winning ceremony at the end of the year, uh, Gough Whitlam was invited to um, present the prizes. Now he was invited because A, he was Prime Minister, but B, he was also an old boy of the school. And I was um, uh, slated to win a, uh, win a prize and I thought, well, how can I disrupt this uh, prize-winning ceremony? Um, but in a polite way, because I was a Knox boy. Um, and so what I did was, when I, it was my turn to go up on the stage to shake Goff's hand, and I think I'm probably the only anarchist ever to have shaken Goff Whitlam's hand, um, I presented him, because my whole school it was, was a liberal party stronghold, I presented, I shook his hand and I said, as a token of our esteem, I would like to present you with this. And I gave him... a. Uh, a campaign button with the Liberal Party slogan, which was, think again, vote Liberal. And <laughs> Gough Whitlam, being the consummate politician he was, just put it in his pocket and laughed and carried on as if nothing had happened. But I had all these parents come up to me afterwards and say, what did you say to Gough? What did you give him? Um, so th th this was the sort of like the, um, uh, the way in which being a, a member of this sort of pre-Workers' Party group had such a radicalising experience on me personally. Uh, I was reading this just a few weeks ago to try and gather my thoughts. And I just wanted to share a couple of things about it with you. One is I was struck with how Randian it was. The, the, the language and the ideas behind it were extremely Randian. So I think the, uh, the Rothbardian um, new element that w was going through the uh, Ayn Rand discussion group hadn't yet penetrated um, so far as to get into the, into the Workers' Party platform. But the good thing about it being so Randian was the extraordinary efforts that the writers took to be consistent, to be consistent philosophically. And this was uh, shown in the, the fundamental principle, which is printed at the bottom of every single page of, this, um, of the platform. And the principle is that no man or group of men has the right to initiate the use of force, fraud or coercion against any other man or group of men. So a very Randian notion. Um, and this is in your face on every single page of the document. Now, Marilyn Giesecke at the time said, isn't this rather sexist? Shouldn't there be sort of more gender-inclusive language? And this was immediately dismissed as just being, you know, crazy feminist stuff and uh, <laughs> was not, not accepted. The other thing that struck me was just how, um, not only consistent was it, but also how radical it was. Because everywhere you see things like um, that these principles apply to everything and everybody, including politicians and public servants. Mm. And this was, I think, something that's extremely quite unique about the Workers' Party uh, document. And the, the last thing I'd say is um, how anti-state it was. And I, please grab a hold of the copy. Um, uh, section 2, 
sorry, article, section two, article four, which is a section called reducing government. And if you just let me read a section of it, you'll see how radically anti-state it is. It said government expenditure, this is what the Workers' Party would do if they got into power. Government expenditure will be continually reduced. In addition to the measures outlined elsewhere, the party will, within 12 months of attaining office, examine the functions of all government departments with a view to gradually reducing them to five in number. There would be the Department for Defence against internal and external aggression, and this would remain, because it was a limited state um, position, that would stay in perpetuity. But the other uh, departments would abolish themselves. Uh, and the second department was the Department for the Review of Laws and the Legal System. So every single law would be reviewed by this department with the ultimate aim of abolishing them. Then there would be the Department for the Reduction of Taxation. Right? The whole purpose of the department is to reduce tax, not to increase it. Another department would be the Department for the Reduction of Government Control. So all, all government legislation would be reviewed and then unravelled. Another one would be the Department for the Rehabilitation of Tax Consumers. Right? So <laughs> tax consumers presumably would be, would be given, government property would be sold off and taxpayers of the past would be compensated for the fact that they'd had to pay taxes over their working life. And then concluding in brackets, the latter four departments would be phased out on completion of their roles. <laughs> so you'd have one department left at the end of the first uh, period of office of the Workers' Party. That is a truly remarkably consistent and radical document, and I'm <laughs> glad I was sitting in and listening to all the discussions when it was being formulated. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's very uh, good to hear the, all these stories and anecdotes. Uh, I'll just tell you mine. I, uh, in 1970, uh, my brother brought back from America a book by Harry Brown called How You Can Profit from the Coming Devaluation. <laughs> Harry Brown was a libertarian, uh, an investment writer, and a very good writer, an excellent speaker. Um, and uh, anyhow, I read a subsequent book by him, and there was a bibliography in the back because what he was saying made sense. Uh, I wrote away for these books by uh, Rothbard and Mises, uh, uh, Rand, uh, uh, I can't remember who else was on the, the list, um, and, and I consumed them and all this stuff made sense, but I was terribly lonely. I mean, I, I had no one to talk to. I'd say, I'd start to bring this stuff up with my mates and they'd want to talk about the football or the surf, surf or whatever it was. And I, had, I, was, I was lonely. And then I saw this ad or this uh, article in the paper, and this was probably 1975, after the first meeting at the Opera House. I didn't know about the organisation. With the unlikely name of the Workers' Party. I mean, that was a turn-off from the beginning. <laughs> but, I, but, I, but I read what was said, and I thought, oh... Oh, I see. Yeah, OK. So I went along to the next meeting, which was in the city. Uh, I think Mark was probably, we, was probably there. Anyhow, at this stage, this was in the Whitlam era, and Whitlam was a communist, I think. He, they all called each other comrade in Parliament in those days. Mm. Uh, and there was great tumult. I mean, they were a most inept government. And then the, the Governor-General fired them and... and Malcolm Fraser came in. I mean, it was a heady time in Australian politics. Uh, but I saw, just saw the, the country going headlong into socialism. I can remember saying to uh, uh, Bob Howard, it's, it's all hopeless. I mean, we're just going headlong into socialism. I don't think you can stop it. And Bob said to me, we have to try. And that was enough to me. So I put my hand up and stepped in and uh, I was on the same uh, Senate platform as Mark for the Senate uh, for the Workers' Party. I think I was the last on it. They wanted a businessman on it. I think I got 20 votes. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, well, you know, the, the Workers' Party had this, this, this quite Quite, I mean, it was a very lively time, and then it went away, and it sort of failed, and, and it's faded in the distance. And of course, if you're under 40, you've probably never heard of the Workers' Party. Even if you're under 50, you probably can't remember it. So it's good to be good to be able to share this. 
I mean, and I sense here there are a lot of um, enthusiastic or hopeful or romantic people who think they can change the legal system. Well, good luck. Uh, I think uh, secession, individual secession or other ways of breaking the state are better than trying to change the system. Anyway, that's my little middle yarn, my little story. And of course, the Workers' Party it did fail as a political party, but it did coalesce a lot of people. I mean, the people here, other, you know, the, the Centre for Independent Studies started out of that. Uh, it was a coalescing force, and it, at least those of us who were libertarians had a few friends to talk to. So it, while it failed politically, it succeeded in doing other things. Okay, that's it. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, I'm Maureen Nathan, and it all begins with Anne Rand. There was a lovely little poster stuck up somewhere. I think I've still got it. If you're interested, come along to learn more about objectivism. <laughs> And I went not to, Pat, uh, not to Bob Howard's room that you knew. <laughs> He'd already moved into something a bit more salubrious by the time you came along, Mark. And you, <laughs> David, you might remember the, the grotty room. Where we I've been just in a few bit, grotty rooms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which one? Well, there I was, <laughs> a little house frau, baby on the way, went along to these meetings, devoured Ayn Rand, listened to Patrick Brooks, Ramon Barros, who is a lawyer, Patrick Brooks is an architect, um, Marilyn Giesekam, who had this big smile and kept saying to the boys, and what about the women? <laughs> and, um, of course, Bob Howard. And devoured all of this information. Used to go home to my um, right of Genghis Khan husband, um, who thought that things were really quite extraordinary, that I should bother to go to Glebe to these meetings. Anyway, we ended up lecturing about objectivism and they'd started this little magazine called Free Enterprise and if you uh, purchase one of Ron's books you'll see um, a cover of that beautifully uh, presented. And I took it on myself to be the marketer of this magazine because they'd just been flogging it on street corners at the cross. Now Marilyn got uh, sold a hell of a lot of them but uh, <laughs> Marilyn was a good looking girl. Um, the rest of us didn't have such success. Anyway, they tried the bookshop and Mark became involved with that. Mark joined, um, uh, we heard about, I heard about Mark, I don't know that we actually met. David, of course, was this little whippersnapper who was uh, listening in on everything and thought Bob was God. Um, <laughs> but justifiably, I think, at that stage, because he was the only one who did this kind of stuff. And then Bob Askin ran for government and a man called John Singleton did his advertising and his car got bombed. And there he was on television saying, all socialists are bums, it must have been one of them that bombed my rolls. So I thought, hey, you're talking out tune. So there I was in Mossman with my right wing husband and I picked up the phone and rang Singleton's office and said, there's this wonderful bunch of people who know all about objectivism and we agree with you about socialism, you know, socialists all being bums because they're lazy so-and-so. Um, could I speak to John Singleton because I was with his PA and she said, he's on holiday. Ring back such and such a date. So I left my name, rang back and got through to John. And much like uh, the conversation about that'll save us five hours, I said to John, Do you, have you by any chance read anything by Anne Rand? And he said, I've just saved my sanity by reading, help me Mark, Virtue of Selfishness. Virtue of selfishness. So I thought, great, told him our spiel <coughs> and arranged for one of us to go and see him with a bunch of free enterprise magazines. Bob Howard ended up going and then there was a lot of secret talks. Bob was very, very excited about stuff, but he wouldn't let on. And then one day he let slip that John had been talking a little bit about maybe doing something in the political arena. Now, I wasn't one to sit back and wait. 
So I invited John Singleton, and I thought it was Maggie. Well, it was Margaret. You see, his wife was Margaret, and his girlfriend was Maggie Eckhart. <laughs> and I spent the whole bloody evening calling her Maggie. No wonder I wasn't very popular, but anyway. Um, and a man called John Slade, who was with Bonds Coates Patons, who shared our views, um, and Bob and Patrick. And during that dinner, John Singleton finally said, could you put a, pro a political platform together in three weeks? You've got three weeks to write it. Three weeks. <laughs> we had the Liberal Party platform. We had the Labor Party platform because we'd been trying to infiltrate. Um, actually, I, at the time, I was vice president of the biggest branch of the Liberal Party in Australia. Yeah, Brookvale and Lambie Heights. My God, uh, things one does for politics or for one's um, philosophy. Um, anyhow, um, so we had those. Um, I then said, well, we'll phone America. So we phoned up and asked for a copy of the Libertarian platform and then I made another phone call to Murray Rothbard. <laughs> Got the time change wrong and rang him at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and he very, very graciously replied and again... Um, oh, by the way, I did most of the note-taking. You know, he said, I've got a memory. It's called being the secretary because that's all women were supposed to be fit for. <laughs> I still have the minutes in a box, mm. and that's what Ron used um, for his book. So um, Murray Rothbard very graciously sent us um, uh, some information, uh, two beautiful letters that were heartwarming, if nothing else. And so we busily wrote the Workers' Party platform. Yes, Mark, you did write the economic section. You're the only one capable of writing the economic section. You knew the jargon. What did Patrick Books and, and Bob wrote? Most of the rest, keeping themselves totally consistent. And if I remember correctly, David, you were one of the consistency makers. You said, that doesn't sound quite the same. I remember that distinctly. Um, and me, I ran around Sydney with a golf ball. Now, none of you would know what a golf ball was for a typewriter. Anybody old enough to remember when we had a golf ball? <laughs> Nadia does. And... Um, so Mark would give me his copy and Bob would give me his and I'd run around Sydney to a lady who was my husband's secretary who graciously typed up the entire platform which we proceeded to give John Singleton on time. In fact, I think we were half a day early. Um, the, we presented it to him under the banner of the Libertarian Party. And we knew that that wasn't... Uh, none of us were particularly happy with that, except we knew what a libertarian was. Every time we said libertarian, they said, come and see me too, because they thought I was a libertarian. Um, fine. So obviously Australia wasn't ready for a word like that. And then I related to the group a um, conversation at dinner, which has been, again, reproduced by Ron. We had a German friend who was a, a prisoner of war, came out here as a DP, named Tia, obviously my parents' age, and we were having this deep and meaningful discussion over dinner one night when I, about capitalism, and I said, well, cap capitalism is what makes everything grow. She said, it's terrible, it's terrible. And she didn't like fascism, she didn't like socialism, but she was really worried about all of this stuff. And I said, but Tia, you're a capitalist. She said, no, I'm not. I said, Tia, your husband's a furrier. Yes, he works. You do piecework. Yes, she works. You own your own house now? Yes. Remember, we were already in the 1970s, huh? 1974, 75. Um, do you own a holiday house in the Blue Mountains? Yes. You have a boarding house that you bought with my parents that you rent out? Yes. I said, well, that makes you a capitalist. She said, no, it doesn't. It makes me a worker. A worker, okay? That makes me a worker. So we had this discussion. What are we going to do? Bob obviously told the story to John Singleton. Apparently in a swimming pool, Lang Hancock decided that of all the names, that's the one the larrikin liked. Mm. I will never forgive John Singleton, however, because I had my little marketing campaign. You know, I was such a genius. You know, I was a housewife. I'd given up my pharmacy career, and I, I really knew so much, didn't I, Mark? <laughs> Pretended to. Anyway, um, I. Hmm? Sorry. Right. More than you <laughs> give yourself credit for. Yeah. 
Mm. Um, by the way, when Marx said that he had long hair, it wasn't only long, it was dirty. <laughs> <laughs> you were the scruffiest person I knew, even beyond my university friend, Sunshine. Oh, dear, oh, dear. And uh, anyway, maybe it was just long. It was dreadlocks before it was dreadlocks. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'd worked out... Hmm? The picture in Ron's book. Yeah. Oh, of that table at, at, at Bob Howard's. Yeah, with your long hair. I had long hair too, but I looked so prim and proper. I was also North Shore Mossman. And mm. Yeah. Um, anyway, my idea was a banner on... Had anyone seen the Eagle Insurance ad? Anyone old enough to remember when Eagle Insurance launched? It started off with a square, with just a round blob. And the next... That the next week it had a little squiggle, and the squiggle got bigger and bigger and bigger over a series of weeks until it was the logo for Eagle Insurance. And that had stuck in my mind. So I figured we should do the same thing. Banner across all the Sunday papers. First week, do you work? Second week, do you work with your head? Third week, do you work with your head, your hand, or your hands? Fourth week, do you work with your head, your hands, or the money you've come by honestly? Fifth week, if you work with your head, your hands, or the money you've come by, honestly, you are a worker. And the workers' party is for you. Instead of which, well, you can see what we presented, <laughs> <laughs> which hardly anyone read. Um, but what the workers' party did, I believe we've succeeded enormously well. I really do. Out of that, we had... People like Nadia Vina and, Elizabeth, uh, and um, Elaine Palmer set up um, Centre 2000. <coughs> we had Greg Lindsay set up CIS. We had people importing the Freeman from the States. We had a plethora of people who joined us, like Nev Kennard. And oh, thank God for Viv. His poems used to keep me sane. Every time I was depressed, one of his gems would arrive in the mail. Fabulous. So all of these things happened. The doctors who were battling against state government, a lot of them came on board at the time. Um, but that's oh, yeah. how Duncan Yule got... That was significant. That yeah, was, uh, that yeah. was a mm. huge mm. Uh, part of what happened. And when I stood many, many times, but amongst others in Farrah, because I moved to Lockhart, which is 40 miles southwest of Wagga, Instead of Bel Belmoral Beach. <laughs> anyway, having stood there, Wolf Five said to me one day, Maureen, thank you for shouting what I can only whisper. My plea to all of you is, we're beyond the whisper stage now. We've got people like Professor Hopper who comes here. We've got people like all of you sitting here. And my recommendation and my plea is, don't leave it another 35 years. Let's be exponential. Let's use the social media. Let's get the message across because, by golly, we've got the arguments and I believe we've got correct attitude on our side. I can echo... <laughs> I'm not sure if that was Superman or Mighty Mouse. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> my name is Jeff McNeil. I'm going to stand up because I'm taller than they are anyway, so you can't tell the difference if I sit down. That's right. That's better. I'd like to uh, say thank you for being given the privilege of saying a few words tonight, but I do have one little claim to fame, and that is, as my badge suggests, I held the record in Australian politics for a few years. The Workers' Party, we were the first ever to campaign, uh, I was the first candidate ever chosen to uh, campaign for the Workers' Party and stand as their candidate, and that was for the sh uh, electorate of Greniff, which is a, a rural electorate surrounding the town of Geraldton, just north of Perth in Western Australia. This was 1975 or 74, 75 I think it was, 37 years ago. And uh, we did very well. I got 13 point... I'll have to correct you, Ron, on this. I got 13.6% of the primary vote. 
and about uh, a year or so later we campaigned again for the same electorate in the state election and I got 16.8% of the primary vote. So we were streets ahead of these. I was going to start my address off tonight by saying, as what, what did uh, Mr. Reagan say? My fellow libertarians, but I, I, I didn't want to go in too much impersonation. Anyway, uh, I didn't try that sort of caper when we were campaigning. We had a very, very uh, competitive and a very, very devoted team of helpers, and we per patrolled all up and down. We got the whole electorate of Greenough, which is a long electorate, and we divided up into grids, into a grid, and we uh, said, OK, we're doing this one today, that, that grid the next day, and so it went on. We had cars provided, people do donated money, cars, everything else, and with a little bit of money uh, from uh, a couple of large sources, we managed to get uh, a campaign rolling which uh, was very, I'd say, successful. So I'd say that the Workers' Party, in one sense, at least once, has been very successful. So don't think that this is a dead issue or a dead philosophy, because it's not. Individualism, free enterprise, and I'll use the word for the last time, uh, Benjamin, uh, a limited government, but small government anyway, is very, very, very much a possibility, and it probably might not happen in my lifetime, because unlike our 18-year-old David here and Vivian and uh, co, these other people who were, uh, yes, yeah, just over 25 he was, I'm, I'm a, bit, uh, <laughs> a bit closer to 40. I've got a, no jokes. And uh, I had, uh, <laughs> well, a good friend of mine said the other day, how many months more are you? And I said 305, but that, that's, that's a separate secondary issue. We did very, very well, as I said, and uh, I think that uh, the main uh, thing that keeps my passion alive is the fact that I can see the country going much the same way as it was when Whitlam was the Prime Minister in this country. I have the uh, me vivid memory of uh, Gough Whitlam addressing people in the Perth Entertainment Centre. He had a, a huge crowd there on one occasion, just after he was sacked. And uh, I see the same sort of things happening now. We haven't got the same public feeling, but I'll tell you what, the people who are thinking, the thinking Australians, are going to put their minds to work and come up with solutions. We can't substitute socialism for socialism. You can't do it. It's, it's just, you know, it's Julia or Tony or somebody. They're probably nice people. I, I'm not knocking them as, as human citizens. They are literally people who are running amok with power. As Ron Manners has always said, what we don't see in politicians today is a role of government. There's no confines in which they can operate. They can write carte blanche checks wherever they want to go, do what they want to do, and as, as, as Professor Hopper said today, they can, uh, they're never as, as moral as the private owner or the private uh, entrepreneur. What we've got to do is to get people educated. We've got to teach them the confines of, of, of our pol political uh, strategy. And that way, and that way only, can we get a basis upon which a political party with sound ideological members can be elected. So th that's fundamental. And the way to do it is not just to keep quiet and say, gee, it was a bit of a talk fest in Sydney. Yeah. I'll go back and get stuck and watch the footy and have a few beers and forget all about it. Because the socialists are, are running right. The, the media's got all sorts of cliches coming out from the newsreaders to the, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, compares of programs. And it's got to stop. It just has to stop. We, we, can't, we can't afford to see it go on any further. Anyway, I'd like to say thank you and uh, let you know that uh, the future is bright and you young people have got to carry the yoke of, of uh, the party forwards and the philosophy in your everyday life and carry it forwards to your family, friends. You don't have to lecture them. You've just got to just be sincere and be what Vivian has become, a libertarian. Thank you. I'm going to confine this to less than a minute. It's late. Uh, we're going to be back here tomorrow. I was with the Workers' Party in South Australia, which is sort of that lovely little stop over place on the way to Perth. So if you want to know something about the, the Workers' Party South Australia, I was number two on the Senate ticket, 
Uh, I got into politics, I suppose, or interest in the politics. Never, never would I want to be a politician. Uh, my mother was a senator. She retired in 1974. She went in when I was 15. And uh, that's when you're at your cynical, rebellious best. And that's when I met all these scumbags that surrounded her. And that's what brought me into the Workers' Party. So if you want to talk about it tomorrow, let's do it.